author is funded by the Pacific Northwest Writers Association, supporting writers from pen to publication since 1955. To learn more about the PNWA and their yearly conference, please go to pnwa.org. Hi, this is Bill Knauer of Author Magazine, and I'm here at Sammamish Library in lovely Sammamish, Washington with Jamie Ford, author of Songs of Willow Frost. Jamie, welcome to Author. Thanks for having me. So Jamie, can you remember when the idea that stories m matter to you first sort mm. of lit up in your head? It's, <laughs> the, the idea that stories matter, for me, I grew up reading comic books and yeah. stories, you know, as a kid, comics as a medium seemed very simple, but I remember in the 70s, there was a time when comics transitioned to adult audiences and there was a character, Jean Grey Phoenix, and she killed herself um, to save the universe. And I remember thinking, that's so deep. Even though, it's, you know, <laughs> I just bought it at 7-Eleven, you know, with my Slurpee. And suddenly stories were bigger than the medium. For me, that was a big awakening, and I was probably you know 11 years old. But that was, that, I, I wish it, it was like I'm reading Moby Dick or Shakespeare, but it really it was X-Men 137. I can tell you wow. the number. Wow. Yeah. But it doesn't matter, does it? Because what happened was that experience lit something up in you about something about life lit up just, yeah. from, just from the X-Men. It was almost uh, like, characters suddenly for me had souls like they weren't just on the page they were real people and then I later read that when that character died people had sent uh, like funeral wreaths to Marvel Comics really? to their office yeah because they were so invested in that character that when she died it hurt and uh, and I felt that it was like wow this is something you know it's a medium that you think is is kind of a, a very forgettable medium but uh, at that point, those characters are unforgettable. All right, so your first published book <laughs> was a little novel called Hotel to Corner of Bitter and Sweet. And so, uh, kapow, yeah. right? So talk about that. I mean, obviously you didn't just wake up one day and say, oh, I'm gonna write this book. They must have been a part of a journey that got you there. Or was it? Was that the first, time, first effort for fiction? was that book? Uh, before that book, I wrote another book, which is terrible. Oh. They, they, they will never be... I didn't see it on your list no, of No, no, no. It's it wasn't published. It'll, oh, okay. It'll, uh, if, if, I, if I, I have to put it in my will, that if I, if I die, it's given a Viking funeral. We just okay. burn that sucker. <laughs> Don't want it to be pop, you know, published posthumously. How long did it take you to write it? First book. Four years. That's not too bad for um, a first novel. Yeah. Have you written a bunch of short stories before yeah. then? Okay. And then the first book I wrote again and again. Yeah. But Hotel only took like took less than a year and so really? it you know I, I I sort of figured things out right and a lot wrong on that other abandoned novel um, and so when I really hit hotel I was really fresh and I and I thought I knew what I was doing and I had a lot of encouragement um, because hotel began as a short story and oh. once I had a, a few people who were published or were editors look at the short story and they really said you should turn this into a novel you should do it now do it quick as you know th this is you know it was the, the kind of um, validation uh, we all search for and when right. you get it it has you know it's 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 almost narcotic I mean it's just yeah. like I unplugged the TV and I just wrote my brains out but so what happened? So you spent, so you re wrote, you rewrote that novel, and did you send it out and do the whole thing, or did you I, just say no? This isn't even the, the thing with the first book was when I when I completeded it, I was I was very excited. I'm like, well, I'm not excited. I'm excited. You've done it. I've done it. Yeah. Right. There's a, there's a, there's an aspect of accomplishment and relief. You're like, right. I wrote a book, and then I rewrote it, and then I could see that that first version wasn't very good, and then I wrote it again, and then I could see the second version still wasn't good, but I was getting better. And by the time I was about three and a half drafts through it, I really grew as a writer. And then I think I just outgrew the story. I was yeah. bored of the story, and I think my skills were ready to tackle something different. Yeah. And also at the time, I had some encouragement just to write what I wanted to write, which was 
historical, multicultural, emotional stuff rather than uh, bleak literary fiction, which I think I thought I was supposed to write because a lot of people think they're supposed to write. I know, write. yeah, and it's and it's stuff that no one reads, and a lot of people don't enjoy writing it. So, I, unless you really love that, right? Unless right. you sincerely know why that's great, yeah. But there's a sense like if you're a serious writer, you got to write that. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what I thought I was. Everybody's going to rewrite Hemingway or rewrite right. Joyce, and I and I, yeah, it was like, you know, but I'm, you're not a bleak guy. I'm not. I'm. I'm it's like. I'm right-handed. It was like writing with my left hand. It yeah. just didn't feel like me. Yeah. And so then you gave yourself per you gave yourself permission totally. to say, look, what do I actually? What's the story I really want to tell? Well, the the, the truth of the matter is, um, around that time, uh, my father passed away. My dad was Chinese, and then I thought I started writing short fiction with Asian characters, which I had never done. That first book had no Asian characters. Because um, I didn't think there was an appetite for that, right. so I thought I'd write for this mainstream world, um, which because there's no Asian people in mainstream world. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> it's so it's such writers are Jamie Tan. are myopic. I know, and I, I looked at that and I thought, no one wants a Jamie Tan. You know, right. that's, who, who wants that? Um, but once my dad died, then I just I was drawn to that. And once I started doing that, people really liked what I was writing, and there was a different reaction. Um, to it was an emotional reaction to what I was writing because it was emotional stuff, and um, and hotel really grew out of that. Yeah. Then so then you publish it and kaboom it gets all this attention. Yeah. Right. And now you're going around the country probably doing the thing. Yep. What yep. was that like? Because you're <laughs> such a you know you're writing is a, you're out in Montana. Yeah. You're, out, you're isolated. What was that like? Uh, it was pretty magical. That first you know it was uh, it was like a. Camelot moment, you know, to, to every every town or market has its Taj Mahal bookstore, its right. iconic indie, whether it's the tattered cover in Denver or Elliott Bay in Seattle. Powell's, yeah. yeah, Powell's, um, politics and prose in Washington, DC. And I got to basically go to all the it was like it was like going to Mecca, you know, right. every day, going to the and 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 sort of bend my knee and worship at these great uh, literary institutions. Um, it was and just to 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 be at these places that I had either visited or I had listened to podcasts of other authors visit right. these stores, and it was so enchanting. It was it was amazing. I, I was in awe. It was of of. In the spectacle from a third party, it would be like, okay, there's just Jamie and like right. 20 people, no big deal. But for me, it was a huge deal. And there's your book on the bookshelf. Yeah. Yeah. Ford. So Faulkner's just a few right letters. Right next to Richard Ford. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But Pul there it is. Pulitzer Prize winner. Right. But I always think that, and I don't think you had to get over, it doesn't sound like you had to deal with that, but I do think every author has to go through that understanding that they, that that bookshelf has no bias. Right. That right. You, you belong up there if you feel that you want to share your work right. with all the people you might have idolized or yeah. worshipped, because we do that sometimes with writers. That was, yeah, definitely. That was, um, when, I, when I had some just feedback from other writers, that was amazing to hear. Other that. writers that you've been reading. Maybe. Yeah, when I heard that Lisa C. was reading it yeah, and really yeah. liked it, that my, it blew my mind. That, wow. that was, a, that was a, a big wow moment. I mean, it still is a big wow moment. Um, it, it, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a very surreal experience, but it's kind of incremental. It's like, um, like if you move to Alaska and it's dark in the winter, right. but it's, it doesn't switch to you know, total darkness overnight. It's like a five minute shorter day every day and slowly it happens. And with, with publishing and the whole experience, it was like that. It was like, okay, the book's going out there and the sales are, are this and it's being appreciated here in schools. And, and everything happened in little baby steps. Um, so it didn't all happen like at once, but something was always happening. So it was, wow. that was interesting. And, and I was just kind of watching it happen. It was, it's like, um, I always say, uh, my book has a career, I'm just along for the ride, which I stole from Pamela Anderson, who said my boobs have a career, I'm just along for the ride. Because it feels like that, you have a bit of a disconnect, and then you know, my editor or my agent would call with some interesting news, and I'd just be like, wow, that's really cool. But I think it's an appropriate thing, a relationship, because the really, it is separate from you. I mean, you it is. Birth, it's almost like a child. Yeah, yeah. You delivered it, but then it's gonna go. It's gonna do whatever it's supposed to do. Yeah. And, and the, the, the cool thing is, the book is the ultimate viral component. Yeah. You, you can come up yeah. with a, you know, you can, uh, 
Facebook and yeah, Twitter. Yeah, and <laughs> you can do all these things, but if the book doesn't do it itself, not, no amount of viral marketing is going to no. make it happen. Thank you. You've got to write a book. <laughs> yeah. People read it, and the still word of mouth. Yeah, there's, there's going to be... they like it. It's all organic, ultimately, which is cool. That's, um, I mean, that's, it's interesting how books written in the 50s will suddenly find a new audience yeah. you know, 50 years later because something clicked and then word of mouth makes it happen. So, Jamie, I've got one more question okay, for sure. you of a sort. So I'd like you to finish this sentence for me. Oh. If writing has taught me anything, it's taught me what? The one thing writing taught me, if it, you know, would be resilience. And it's um, not just rejection. I think rejection I could handle. I mean, I, I was in an artistic field where I had work rejected on a daily basis. I'm a pretty thick skin. But it's a resilience in being able to validate your own conviction about your own work, because there's so many other voices uh, out there, um, in addition to your own voices of right or wrong, doubt, success. And somewhere in the middle, there's usually a voice that says, this is what you should be doing. And you kind of doubt yourself every step of the way. But to be resilient enough to keep plugging away and keep working, keep working, um, not sure if what you get to the end might be 300 pages later and it may not be what it should be, um, to be resilient and just keep going when you don't, you know, you don't have a, a, a success story at the end. You're just putting it out there into the world. I think that takes a, a certain kind of resilience, a certain kind of mad resilience, um, if anything, but resilience is a good word.